Hi, I'm Jason Chung, head of the esports practice at Zuber Lawler. And I'm Philip Milestone, counsel at Zuber Lawler. Zuber Lawler is a law firm, and like any good lawyers, we have a big disclaimer for you. We are lawyers, but we're not your lawyers. Until you pay us. So everything here is for entertainment purposes only. Again, until you pay us. This podcast is brought to you by virtualtimes.com. Virtualtimes.com, your news from the metaphor. Hello, MetaSapiens, and welcome back. This episode, we're going to be talking about gaming and Web3 again, specifically about uh, if gamers actually hate Web3 or not. Uh, and to delve into these issues, we have a wonderful guest, Alex Lee from Digiday, who's the gaming and esports business uh, journalist extraordinaire over there. But first, uh, Philip, uh, how are you doing? I'm good, Jason. Thank you very much. Love to be uh, here, as always. One of the things I've always wanted to talk to you about, Philip, is, uh, you know, I know that you game a little bit with uh, with Tico and you play Fortnite, but are you a gamer? Would you describe yourself as a gamer? I wouldn't. Um, I feel as if uh, any real gamer would be offended if I said that I was a gamer. I'm very, very casual in terms of my gaming. Um, Fortnite is probably what I played the most. I, there are certain games I have enjoyed. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn was a real I mean, just beautiful game and a ton of fun to play. Spider-Man, not the new one. I only have a PS4, not a PS5. Um, so I haven't played the new one, although I hear it's amazing. But the, the old one was was great. And they had sort of the, the Miles Morales add-on. Those are both cool. Um, and then I would say that's that's probably it. I mean, going back, right? Uh, Katamari was fun when I had a PS2 years ago. And then before that, it was like the the original Nintendo, right? So I've never been the one to go out and, and get the new console. I'm not an early adopter in terms of gaming consoles. I do a bit of mobile gaming, right? I, I was on the Words with Friends train. Um, I do play stuff like Wordle and New York Times. Spend some time with Pokemon Go. Uh, but that's that's really it for me, right? Um, I would never call any of that hardcore. I couldn't tell you, you know, uh, Elden Ring, from any other game that has, you know, dragons and wizards and whatnot. So yeah, I'm I'm exposing myself. I'm I'm opening myself up. Meta sapiens, please don't crucify me in the comments. But I while I enjoy a game, I, I think it would just be unfair to gamers to call myself a gamer. You though, Jason, I think probably wear that crown. Yeah, well, it's it's my no, uh, it's my uh, job to know about gaming and esports, and uh, you know, both uh, obviously in the legal capacity, but also in my capacity as an educator at, at NYU. Um, so it's something that I look into. But I got to tell you, Philip, you know, by my definition, you are a gamer, right? I mean, really? uh, ultimately, yeah, ultimately, you know, I know there's a lot of gatekeeping in the gaming community about what a true gamer is, but really. You know, even if you play Candy Crush, technically, uh, you you are a gamer, right? That's an expansive definition. And Absolutely. by the way, when you're mentioning things like, uh, you know, Katamari Damacy, when you're when you're talking about like knowing about what Elden Ring is at all, you're you're in the top 20 to 30 percent of people globally <laughs> about that. stuff. So I, I think you're selling yourself short. So I'll take it. You know, uh, it's one of those. Things, but the question here I have is, what do you actually like to do in a game? I mean. You know, for me, it's kind of a sense of retreat to a certain degree. So even though, you know, it's my job to know about the esports business and how it operates, uh, to be honest, you know, 12 year olds yelling at me uh, for not <laughs> for being the world's worst Counter-Strike player is probably not something I do for fun a lot of the time. It's something what yeah. I do when I when I feel a competitive itch and I do it pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I just play AAA titles uh, like GTA 5, like old titles, and I'm just chilling out. I'm just relaxing. Yeah. I'm just mowing down pedestrians because guess what? It's not sociopathic if it's in the context of a video game, right? Yeah. So what do you like yeah. to do in a game? How do you game? Ooh, I, I like quests, right? I like the 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 attaining of, of awards and whatnot. I will do like 100% of the quests in the game, right? So but again, the ones I mentioned earlier, like Horizon, I would, if there was a side quest, I was all over it. Um, I was having a great time, you know, nailing machines from as far away as I possibly could. You know, I was definitely modifying my bow and making sure I had the right weapons together and using them all. Um, but like just just driving through in the main quest, it was not my style. I liked their main quest. It was very sort of post-apocalyptic, you know, and the, the world had ended and whatnot. 
and that sort of appeals to my, you know, my dystopian science fiction fandom. Um, in terms of, of Fortnite, same thing. I think it's the it's the questing, right? It's the getting the XP, it's the getting the accolades, it's getting the skins, it's you know solving their silly little puzzles. You know, collect so many gnomes in so many different places or whatnot. Um, that's fun. I, there there is a rush in in like completely pwning somebody and like doing it in a beautiful way. Like I have to say that like there is that competitive edge is fun. Like when you when you nail them or you you win and just have a little bit of health. Like you know you get that rush. And the victory royales are fun, you know, definitely. I love getting those. Uh, Spider-Man was a little bit different. I feel like it's probably my least favorite, most played game because at the end, it just got very boring. Um, the story was fine, right? But that that whole arc has been, you know, beat up so many times. It wasn't really a surprise. Uh, and at the end, it just became, you know, repetitive. You know, it was just button smashing, right? Find a new way to beat up the bad guy. And the thing is, there wasn't a new way to beat up the bad guy. It's just, you know, punch, kick, flip, pit, you know, web, web, web. Yay. So I like, I like variety, right? I do. I like the story. Um, there have been certain games I've tried to play that are sort of famous for their story. Uh, but then again, I also got bored. Like for me, um, Bioshock, right? It's probably uh, sacrilegious, but I tried to play that one. And again, it was very, the story was very intriguing, right? Definitely. Like you're in this again, dystopian world. I was like, this is totally my bag. But then hmm, just the same thing. Weird zombies trying to kill me and did, didn't do it. So what do I like about gaming? I like questing. I like side quests. I like main quests. I like sort of gaming achievements. I like leveling up. Um, I like a beautiful story and I love a beautiful image. I mean, I guess that sounds simplistic when I say it out loud, because isn't that right? That's what everybody likes, I suppose, or maybe maybe not. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is, you're definitely on the completionist side of things, and I'm the same way, right? Like, I, I like to collect everything, but I, I probably lose patience a lot faster than you. So I, I'm, I, I have a lot of 70%, you know, 80% done the stuff, you know, I've never got into a... I don't think I've ever 100 percent did a game, for instance, right? Mm. Um, you know, and uh, definitely, uh, I think I got burnt out of questing when I played like Arkham, uh, Arkham City, or what, the Batman games where you have to collect all the Riddler, uh, you know, prizes or puzzles or whatever. And like that, that really burnt me out of like questing at, at a certain point. And now I just yeah. sort of play it just to, you know, just the point where I think it's fun. Actually, you, you remind me of a, a game that I 100 percented. That was, I mean. I still remember it fondly, even though I've played it since, and I think it's probably better in my brain. And that's Myst, the original M M Y S T. When you're sort of just on the island and there's nothing, right? And it was, it was a PC game in the, I mean, '90s, maybe eight, maybe late '80s, right? Like the graphics were, it was cool for its time, you know. And I think it was groundbreaking for its time. But you play it now, and like my kid got, my kids got bored quickly. Um, but I sat in front of my dad's. Apple IIe, I think, right? And I played that thing just straight through. Could not get enough. I think it was a Windows 95 game, but, you know, like, because... Uh, was it not? Yeah. I it was It wasn't, my, wasn't an app. I don't, again, I don't even remember. I don't remember having a Windows machine, though. I don't know, man. I just remember it being awesome. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing, though. Like, I, I like the same thing as you. I, I like going through everything. I like, you know, immersing myself in a world. I've never once had the compulsion when I play a game, and maybe it's because I'm extraordinarily cheap when I'm about in-game items, but I've never thought to myself, let's pull out the credit card and buy something now. I'm enjoying myself so much. I need to buy this camel if I'm playing, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Origins, you know, Assassin's Creed Origins. I've never really thought that way, right? Yeah. Um, do you buy stuff in games? I mean, I know no. you do a little bit to a certain extent for... You know? Well, the only game I do that for is Fortnite, right? And that's because mm -hmm. to play the battle pass, to get the quests, you know, you have to you have to buy that. So I'm on the Fortnite crew, which is their subscription service um, every month. I think it's like $11. Uh, so that that's but that's that's it. Um, the other games that I've played, there aren't really upgrades that I'm trying to remember. Again, Horizon, no, Spider-Man, no, you just buy it once and you have the whole thing. And then before, you know, <laughs> this century, I don't think it was a thing to buy uh, things in game. Um, I guess War I, I guess Warcraft could. I tried to play Warcraft a little bit, but that also wasn't my jam. Um, so no, I don't spend a lot of money on games. Um, we've talked about this a little bit before in terms of budgeting, right? And if anything, like I think that gaming is helping my kids learn budgeting. So they they earn, for example, V-Bucks and I don't buy them more, right? They have to either earn more or they get a certain number, excuse me, through their subscriptions in Fortnite. And I kind of like that. 
neither of them have access to sort of uh, the ability to buy things through their phones or their or the PS4 without me. Um, and they're they're pretty good about it, right? So I don't know. I I certainly will never pull out the card to get through to the flashy skin just because, right? In fact, for a long time, I'll be honest, I played Fortnite without buying a thing because it didn't really matter, right? You could play with the basic skins and you could still shoot people. Um, I was wrong. It's a lot more fun if I do buy it. <laughs> but I'm definitely, no, I'm I'm with you. I'm never going to buy a thing, certainly not just for aesthetics. Well, I say that now and I, and I 100% bought the Terminator skin when it came out. So that, that's not true, right? I will definitely buy some things that they, if they touch my, my nostalgia buttons for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I feel you on being more conservative about buying things online, especially for a game where the gameplay mechanics are mostly free. I mean, but I think we're we're growing into the minority on that one, uh, Philip. Like, uh, I think I think it's just showing the fact that we're getting older about our attitudes about this stuff. If we buy a game, it should come with everything included, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of the things that we see and, you know, even with, when people think about Web3 and gaming, uh, you know, this this sort of collecting is a big part of it, right? Especially for Gen Z, Gen Alpha, more so, right? It's about doing collectibles and skins and and you know buying stuff on on you know uh, exchange, uh, you know, and stuff like that. And, and you know, uh, obviously there might be some securities concerns there and everything like that. But at the end of the day, it's about collecting, right? And that seems to be a yeah. big part of the culture, just like the way that people. I, I think it's a little bit past my generation, but people collected Pokemon cards, for instance, uh, more tangible things. But now it seems to be more digital, right? Uh, do you find that's the case with your kids? Like they they like collecting things digitally? I don't know. Neither of them are, I mean, this is just my kids, but no, I wouldn't say they're collectors, right? Um, if they are, like cool rocks are just as cool as as digital skins. So I don't, they certainly don't have that urge I think maybe there's a thing to be said for one-offs, right? Like certainly like if you get in early and you get this thing because you were an early adopter, like that, that gives you cred in whatever universe that happens to be in. So uh, again, I see that happen with certain skins like, oh, like that's a season one skin like that. Who's definitely been playing a while for example, um, or it happens with NFTs a little bit. Uh, you get these, Popes for having been a place. I'm probably mispronouncing that. It's, a, it's one of those words that I've only ever seen written. <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. I don't know if it's a Pope or Poap or whatever it is, but it's these, these proof of attendance protocol NFTs and there it's a, it's a special badge. Anyway, the idea of sort of having some outward signifier that only the in crew will truly understand, but is objectively cool. So even if you're not in, you can still see it as a cool thing. I see the value in that, right? That's that's kind of fun. Um, and that happens in every universe, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, music, whether it's um, cars, you know, e even if, if it's food, right? Or, or wine, there's always these things that signify to the inside crew that you are of them. And I'm okay with that. I'm not a big fan of gatekeeping, like you said, on, on the early side. I don't want that, uh, like, uh, like <laughs> you don't even understand that like, you wouldn't know, like that stuff sucks, right? Like if you're going to be excited about something, like that's awesome. Don't be a jerk about something, but you know, be excited. And if your excitement means that you want to collect cool things in your universe, rock and roll, man, whether, you know, Warhammer 40,000 figurines or sweet NFTs, doesn't matter. I'm, I'm a big fan of people being into stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think digital collecting is, you know, totally normal and fine like any other kind. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a big, uh, you know, that idea of like digital collecting is, is, is the underpinning of why, you know, a lot of these video game companies, as well as, you know, Web3 sort of, uh, you know, um, enthusiasts basically try to create these assets, right? Because, hey, if it's cool and, you know, people will trade it, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like Field of Dreams. Like if we build it, they'll come, right? And, you know, we have a generation that's a little bit more comfortable buying things online to be part of the in crew and of existing part of their lives online at the very least, right? I, yeah, I, I will say, I think I'd be more comfortable to earn a thing like that than to buy a thing like that. I think there's a there's a privilege context that I certainly need to recognize. You know, paying subscriptions every month for a game, even buying a new game, right? I mean, they can be, you know, 70, 80, sometimes more than that. It's, it's, it's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not everybody has the ability to do that for every new thing. Same thing with sort of being an early adopter for for consoles, right? I mean, they're expensive. Um, uh, and I think that there's, I, I don't want to confuse people being more comfortable with buying things in game 
with people having no choice but to buy things in game, right? Um, I'm, you know, blessed enough that I can do things like buy subscription services without ads because <laughs> I hate ads, right? And it drives me nuts. And I would much rather pay a little bit more to have my 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 watching or my experience without ads or my gaming experience without ads, right? Same thing on my phone. If I buy a, a game, I will always look to see if there's sort of an option for me to play that game without ads because the idea of playing a game with ads just, you know, it's like nails on a chalkboard. But not everybody can do that. And I don't want us to confuse. I don't want the world to confuse. And maybe you can tell me if this is being confused. So many people playing sort of the, the freemium version of a game, right? I don't want that to be confused with them being okay playing the freemium. I just don't know if they have the ability. I feel like you know the, the corollary is with privacy. When Facebook made it impossible to be private and Zuckerberg concluded from that that no one cared about privacy, like that was the wrong conclusion. <laughs> and so here, I don't, I don't want to do something similar. You know, I think you've nailed the crux of the issue, uh, Philip, right? You know, I think when it comes to Web3 and gaming, I don't think the... the, the the resistance is the idea that you can get a cool digital, right? I think the resistance is the idea of like, hey, if I'm already paying for the game, right? So if you're a triple A uh, game uh, publisher, right? And you're and you're charging 60, 70 bucks for the game, and then you add more monetization channels onto it and ads and buy, to buy the battle pass and buy the new season pass. I think that's where people are, are, gamers are really experiencing burnout, right? Because ultimately, you know, it's very different than having an esports title, right? If you want to play League of Legends, you can play League of Legends for free. Like the whole game is there for you to f play for free. If you don't want to pay, you know, put a single dime into it, you don't have to, right? But of course, it makes it more fun for you if you buy the little pretty skins and everything like that, and you make your character a little bit more custom, right? Um, those are that's the difference between sort of like an esports title uh, and a AAA title. But right now, I think game publishers are are sort of coming up with the wrong conclusions, right? Mm -hmm. For you know when they can charge 60, 70 bucks, and they're like, well, but these guys are also making money off all these skins and in-game monetization. And why don't we put that in our game? But honestly, if I pay 60 or 70 bucks, I don't want to pay more. Like no. oh, full stop, right? Like you, I'm either you're either you know going to get me for sixty and seventy bucks by selling me a triple A experience. That's great. That's that's you know first of all should be good out of the box, right? None of yes. this. We're going to add more stuff in a year and a half later. CD Project Red, you know, and and Cyberpunk, right? <laughs> you know, it's got to be good for when I buy it, right? Yeah. Because you know that's the exchange of goods that we were we that you know our generation and the generation after us was sold, right? Like if you give us 50, 60, now 70 bucks of your hard-earned cash, you're going to get a great game. But now I don't I don't see that at all. And especially I see that with sports titles, right? Like I if you buy FIFA or if you buy NBA 2K, you pay for the game the game is the same from last year, functionally, pretty much the same. They add like hyper motion or something, but it never has any tan tangential real impact on the game, it feels like, or they make mm -hmm. it actively worse. They add in tons of advertising, tons of you know video streaming and stuff like that. Why don't you check out our new league? And why don't you check out our NBA 2K league game? Uh, and then also you have to buy the seat, you know, you have to buy the packs and get the new players if you want to play on. It's just exhausting. And I do think the problem maybe, and I think Web3 has has based that backlash a little bit. Maybe they're, you know, because, you know, I, I, one of the things I do like about the Web3 ga game experience is they've been very transparent to a certain degree that like you have to pay to engage in this, right? It is pretty open and out there. But I think gamers as a group are just maybe sick and tired of being nickel and dimed everywhere, right? You know, before for mm -hmm. esports titles, it was just this thing that you 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 downloaded for free, you played, yes, ads were part of the 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 ecosystem because they needed to be, otherwise there's no game. But now it's bleeding everywhere else. And this gamification, which is a word I absolutely hate ever, you know, is 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 everywhere, right? I if I go play buy a ticket to go to, you know, SoFi Stadium. I'm also going to be blasted with ads every minute and a half, right? Like, you know, they're just going to, there's in, in fact technology designed to blast me with ads when I'm there. I'm already there consuming the content. <laughs> I'm already there to watch the football game. Why am I getting blasted with ads the entire time? Like it, it honestly, to a certain extent, I do feel that fatigue. And I think it's something that, you know, game publishers, web three uh, developers, everybody's going to have to maybe come to terms with because I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm the person that actually has ad blockers, same as you, not because I'm too cheap to pay for the content. And I resent that notion. I just, it makes my computer run like dog 
poop. You know what I mean? It, 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 yeah. it also shows me ads that are sometimes upsetting. You know, it's a, it also shows me things I don't want to see a lot of the time. So I, I don't know about you, Philip, but, uh, you know, is that the reason why gamers might have been more reticent, you think, uh, to to, you know, Web3? Uh, is, is this general like fatigue of being like marketed at all the time? Or is there something else? I mean, y- you would know the answer to that question better than me. I think that you're probably hitting something about the American experience in the 21st century, possibly the the, the the modern experience in the 21st century that people are just being blown away. I mean, I can't, I can't speak to other places. <laughs> I can barely speak to this one. But certainly I think people are sick of being nickel and dime. That it is happening this way in gaming, I think definitely is going to bring fatigue. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who sort of don't know anything different, right? And that is sort of upsetting. Like, like you want to tell them it used to be that you could buy the game out of the box and you could play the whole thing. Like it, it used to be true and they took it from you, but and I'm not ready to start the revolution. Um, I, I will say that the one of the promises of what you know, Web3 gaming is while you have to buy everything up front, some of the promises that you would then own that thing, right? In a way that you don't in pre-Web3 game, and that you could potentially sell that thing going forward. So there was sort of a, a profit motive to be had. Um, so Web3 Gaming says things like, hey, like you have this thing, you own this thing. And if you sell this thing on the secondary market, like you can make money from that thing. And you could be able to do that because it's a, you know, it's not an in-game asset. It lives, it lives on chain. It's separate from the game. It's its own entity, right? That promise has been communicated a lot in the past few years, I think. But I I don't see that happening a lot sort of in the world, right? I don't see gamers or anybody actually taking these these assets and turning around and making a lot of money off them. I, I know what's happened in the past. A counterexample, again, actually, is, is I think World of Warcraft, right? Which even sort of pre-Web3 had a, a, a vibrant real-world economy. Um, and I, I do think that there, there might be some games out there where there's sort of are things being bought and sold I, I don't know the mechanics of EVE Online. That to me is sort of an amazing little ecosystem. I, I don't know if they can buy and sell their assets or if, it's all, if it all belongs to a centralized company. I don't know. But I will say that, that that promise of, hey, come to this game, buy your assets up front. Um, yes, we know that's a lot of money. But unlike other games, you can possibly sell those assets on a secondary marketplace, right? That tale has been told, but I've yet to see that come to fruition. And I, and I think there's probably some, I have some fatigue of the promise of web three, right? Everybody keeps telling me it's going to change the world. And the thing is like, I'm a believer. I think it is going to change the world, yeah. but I'm definitely tired <laughs> of being told it's going to change the world. And then it just doesn't happen yet. Right. And I'm, I'm involved in that ecosystem. I'm trying to make it happen. Like I'm a very much an evangelist. Um, and so that frustration happens from a lot of different sources, but nonetheless, were I a gamer and were I told two, three years ago that if I do this thing, I'll be able to sell it on a secondary market and I still can't, or, I can't because there's just not enough people adopting it. I'd be frustrated too. Yeah, I'm in the Missouri stage where uh, I'm in the show me state. Uh, you know, because uh, <laughs> I, you know, for me, I, I, exactly the same as you. Uh, you know, I think I think one of the things that, and we'll discuss this with Alex. Um, you know, we've been told a lot about what could happen, uh, but it's yeah. been communicated uh, ad nauseum, right? At this point, you know, what is the actual platform? How would it work? You know, how would it benefit people? Uh, all of these have not been shown, right? And we can't demonstrate it. And that's the frustrating part, right? Like I, you know, uh, you know, we'll see with Alex. He's he's a, he's more of a, uh, you know, maybe even more sunny on it than we are in a lot of ways, right? Even though he hears mm. a lot more negative stuff from gamers all the time. I'm pretty sunny on actually the, the technological applications, right? You are too. That's why we're here. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it's it's probably a tech show uh with uh with not as much i don't know application right now yeah. right like a tech demo doesn't really do anything for me at this point right yes it's yeah. cool yes we can transfer things but i could have done that in web 2 right mm. what's the web 3 special sauce like who's demonstrated that in a way that sort of makes sense uh yeah. and so far i i'm sad to say i don't really think anybody um obviously there's people out there you know uh 
you know, either people working towards it, whether that be maybe our existing roster of existing clients, potential clients, people out there, but there's people working on it, but nobody has still made it to market. And I think we're pretty honest about that. And, and that's actually, I think a good segue to our, our talk with Alex, right. You know, and we're going to talk about, Hey, how do gamers actually feel about this? What's the future of web three in gaming? And does it actually have any promise, uh, you know, going forward? So yeah. MetaSapiens, looking forward to that. And we're going to transition to Alex right now. All right, MetaSapiens, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest, Alex Lee, uh, reporter extraordinaire for Digiday. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Always a pleasure, Jason. All right. So, you know, uh, obviously, I know you very well, Philip, you, you've just met, but uh, can you tell for our audience, uh, you know, who are you? What's your expertise in the field of gaming, metaverse and Web3 and all that kind of stuff? Like, uh, you know, it's always best in your own words, right? So what's your background with all this stuff? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Alex Lee. Uh, if you're looking for my byline, I am professionally known as Alexander Lee. Uh, and I've been writing about the gaming industry for about six years now. Um, however, my work has only really started to touch on the metaverse over the last couple of years. For the first four years or so that I was writing about gaming, it was very much through the lens of esports and competitive gaming. Um, as a freelancer, I wrote for various outlets like ESPN and the Washington Post, um, very much about that sort of specific competitive niche. A couple of years ago, I was hired as Digiday's first gaming and esports reporter. And Digiday is a publication that covers largely the marketing and advertising industries. And so that really expanded the scope of what I was looking into uh, right around the same time that meta became meta and this concept of the metaverse became a, a very hot button uh, discussion topic pretty much everywhere in tech and no more so than in gaming. Um, very early on, it became clear to me that the companies that were actually building these immersive worlds where people actually wanted to play were by and large gaming companies. And so I started to cover the metaverse more and more, but particularly through the lens of gaming um, and, and with the idea that if the metaverse does happen, it will arise out of these kind of organic gaming environments um, that we're starting to already see pick up in popularity. Uh, and so that's sort of my lens into these things. Obviously, my work now touches on blockchain technology and Web3 and the many ways in which that may or may not form the building blocks of this kind of metaverse concept. Uh, and so I feel pretty well prepared to discuss this topic today. Um, and yeah, happy to answer whatever questions you guys might have. So yeah, thanks uh, very much for that, Alex. You know, obviously, you and I on, on a personal level had many discussions about what the metaverse is and what it could be. But, you know, how would you personally define what what is the metaverse right in in a world where we already have interactive worlds and gaming and everything what does the metaverse mean and what's different about it from regular gaming and what are some key things that uh, would be relevant for gamers from your perspective yeah fundamentally when people talk about the metaverse uh, i think what most of them mean is a more embodied form of the internet uh, a version of the web where you you occupy an actual avatar uh, and you move around in a persistent uh, and, and massively multiplayer space with other people operating avatars that in some way represent themselves. Uh, and, and to your point, this is already literally happening in games. I mean, you talk about games like Roblox um, or Fortnite or even going back to things like RuneScape. I mean, World of Warcraft, this, this has been happening for quite some time. And so to some extent, I think the metaverse is just a repackaging of activity that's been happening for a while. Um, there are a couple of aspects, I think, that make today's so-called metaverse environments different or at least theoretically different from games. Uh, one is the content that's happening in there. I mean, games are inherently a form of entertainment. Um, they're, they're a place where you go for a distraction, not necessarily to transact business. And I think the promise of the metaverse is that it will allow people and companies and brands to translate other aspects of existence besides entertainment into these virtual worlds, the same way that we now do everything on the internet. Um, so the idea is eventually you'll be able to go to a virtual store and buy a three-dimensional representation of a physical object that is then shipped to your doorstep. Or if you have to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles to renew your driver's license, you can go to a virtual DMV and get your license uh, redone there and, and so on and so forth. So that that is a little different than I think the 
social activity that's happening inside games and, and that version, that older uh, version of virtual environments. And then I think the second thing, and this is really crucial that separates the pie in the sky vision for the metaverse from what people are doing in games right now is the concept of interoperability uh, and being able to swap your identity and swap your assets between different virtual worlds. Uh, so just to, to sketch that out, you're you're playing Fortnite and you buy a banana costume skin for your character, uh, and then you can take that costume and wear it on your avatar inside Roblox or in Call of Duty or on Decentraland or whatever. This promise of uh, interoperability is why so many people have made a killing selling virtual items like Board Ape Yacht Club profile pictures and what have you because of the promise that eventually those things will actually have utility beyond like the one platform where they were born. Uh, and so those two things, I think, are like the kind of crucial differences between what people were doing in games in the past and what companies that say they are building the metaverse are trying to get to right now. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, your narrative there sort of has a persistent theme of, of uh, let's say, say virtuality, virtualness, um, that the reality is going to be immersive, persistent. I like the way that you described it. Um, this is a discussion Jason and I have had over many episodes, and that's the distinction between virtual and augmented. Do you think the metaverse necessarily is is virtual, like Im immersive, or do you admit or allow that the metaverse, a metaverse, can also just be, you know, uh, what we mistakenly call the real world, but plus? Yeah, so that's a great question, because obviously Facebook slash meta has bet a lot of their uh, metaverse investment on the idea that virtual reality like headset wearing virtual reality will be how most people access this world. Uh, but I, I do not think that that is the case. I, I would totally explicitly say that if metaverse building companies want to actually achieve scale, then then doing that through virtual reality is a fool's errand because the reality is that a fraction of a percent of consumers in America or worldwide own a virtual reality headset or have even tried one at this point. And so if you want people to actually experience immersive environments, then you need to get them to do it through technology they already own. So a gaming console or even just a, a two-dimensional computer screen that allows people to look into a simulated three-dimensional environment. Um, so I would say virtual reality, while it's, a, it's amazing technology for the people who own headsets and are willing to, you know, put in the work to get used to it and, and, and spend significant time in there. I mean, I, I have a headset and I think you know, when I'm actually willing to charge it up and, and go through the effort of clearing out my living room so I can actually use it, which is frankly only a few times a year, it is amazing. But if I just want to hang out with my friends, I can't do all that stuff every time. Absolutely. You know, uh, it's funny that you talk about, you know, interacting and, in, uh, you know, online uh, in virtual in, you know, obviously the gaming context, but also being able to transact business. You know, I could swear when I play 2K, that's already here. Mm -hmm. All right. Like every the whole thing feels like an ad. Um, and that actually kind of takes me to the next point, which is just like, what do gamers actually think about the metaverse and Web3? I mean, I obviously have an idea, but from your perspective, I'm just curious, like what's 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 the you know, what's the general T on all of this? So, you know, it, I think that is changing over time, to be fair. So historically, I think people did not like to see brands in their games at all. Um, it was just not done in a very, I don't use this word that much, but authentic way. I think you can say that in the past, brands were just not, were being slapped into games in a way that distracted from the experience instead of augmenting it. I, I think marketers and brands are actually getting wiser to that now, and they're starting to integrate into games in a way that is additive and, and a little more appealing to gamers. For example, uh, Chipotle doing in-game tournament brackets in Street Fighter was a tremendous success for them and actually resulted in people chanting Chipotle in the audience at Evo, the big fighting game championship and, and things like that. So I think when people are given something, like when, when a new function is added to the game or they gain an, an item or something, I think they're more amenable to that kind of brand involvement and and there's a generational shift happening there where like you and i we grew up playing games where that wasn't the case and so we're unspoiled and we understand like the purity of games as an art form but younger gen z and gen alpha kids games have always had brands to them just like tv has always had commercials and so they don't even question that presence and i think as long as and i think maybe they they understand the value exchange there 
more naturally than we do. Over time, there actually is more and more of an opening for brands and advertisers to enter games in a way that doesn't turn people off. Now, that's a little different than the question of do gamers like Web3, right? Because Web3 specifically pertains to the use of blockchain technology in games to achieve this interoperable pie in the sky future that I was talking about before. And I think gamers see through that 99% of the time because they have been in these games for long enough that they know that interoperability isn't real. And so until that, that that's actually proven, I think most gamers are, yeah, they're totally willing to get advertised to and even like gain like that Coca-Cola limited edition skin inside Fortnite. If they have to buy an NFT to make that happen, I think that immediately makes the entire thing just kind of sus to them. <laughs> Alex, the Web3 experience you're describing at least that you did just describe was very consumptive, right? I am, I'm in the game and then there is sort of advertising. Is it additive? Um, there's, there would seem to be sort of a, another type of web three experience. And that would be sort of the ownership, right? Where it's no longer, you know, large game company publishing a thing. It could be all the players band together with their ideas. And you know, it could be that the, there's some centralized thing that, builds levels and helps you game up, but big decisions are made by people who own pieces of the company. Um, and that I think is some of the promise of, of Web3. Um, I like that you call it pie in the sky. Certainly, you know, DAOs have their problems, yeah. but is is there a Web3 future where the gamer is no longer just a consumer? Absolutely. Um, but the the word that I, the, the phrase that I always use to describe what you're talking about is user-generated content or UGC. The mm -hmm. idea that Games, just like platforms like YouTube and Twitch, more and more grew to rely on the content created by their user base instead of producing their own content. Games will be the same way, where eventually they'll just become platforms where people can go and create and sell their own content. And this is already... and So, so, so yes, I totally agree that that's the future. Now, is Web3 technology necessary to make that happen? Uh, I'm not going to say no. And I think DAOs are one of the more... like unique and, and certainly promising uses of the technology. But uh, I am not convinced personally that you need to have an integration of blockchain technology to be the underpinning of player ownership of in-game content. There is no blockchain bedrock to Roblox, and there is no blockchain integration in Fortnite Creative right now. And both of those are platforms that allow people to create ostensibly own and gain revenue from their own in-game experiences. And so, you know, again, like if this world becomes truly interoperable, then all of a sudden I get why blockchain technology is important, but I'm I there isn't like a clear pathway to get there because there's no incentive for the big platforms like Roblox or Fortnite slash Epic Games to actually allow allow that. They already have these vibrant economies taking place inside their own walled gardens. Yeah, and I think that reflects a lot of the conversation that Philip and I have been having, especially with other guests, uh, Alex, you know, in the sense that, you know, everybody loves UGC, everybody wants that, uh, you know, in their world, but what's the incentive to build it, right? I mean, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm not a I'm not a D and d player, but I understand it's hard to get a good dungeon dungeon master, right? And, and, and to, and for somebody to guide that process from the community standpoint, right? And to, to be able to do that is, of course, the dream, but, you know, probably, it's, we're probably underestimating, and a lot of people, I think, in this space are underestimating just how hard and how much expertise you need to marshal somebody into a world. And some of that happens by organically, and some of that happens because a big publisher says, "Hey, you know what? We're going to do something, uh, and we're going to do, and we're going to, you know, layer it with with you know blockchain technology and Web three. Yep. But of course, you know, like you said, if you're a huge publisher anyway. What is the incentive? It's just another layer of uh, complexity. Um, do you see a world in which, you know, like uh, let's say Epic will say, "Let's do it. Let's let's go all in because it will help some aspect of our business." What aspect of their business could it help? So I, you know, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen because Epic has already shown some interest in, in dipping its toes into that. For example, it owns this platform called Core, which is a, a blockchain enabled platform that allows people to build virtual environments and virtual assets in Unreal Engine, which is you know, obviously the big money maker for Epic. So Epic is interested in this technology and it's experimenting with it. Uh, but I think in order, for, in order for it to actually be convinced to all of these smaller blockchain game developers, 
need to build like a coalition or something mm-hmm. and and like achieve a, a a collective scale that is larger than the epics of the world and they're nowhere near that yet uh so as long as epic is the big dog yeah i i don't i just don't see a pathway there but i know that epic is interested in keeping tabs on this so it's possible that winds will change in time you know, one of the key words that uh, is going around, obviously, uh, in, in gaming, but also in Web3 is consolidation, right? It's, it's uh, you know, uh, not as many players, maybe bigger players, like you were saying, you know, not, mm-hmm. not in terms of individual game players, but like in terms of like industry players. Um, is that a good thing necessarily? I mean, you know, aren't gamers or could gamers be concerned by the fact that, hey, your actual like entertainment experience is now being you know, controlled by a dwindling number of companies, right? I mean, Activision, uh, Blizzard being bought out by Microsoft, you know, what does that mean? And also, uh, you know, in in Web3, there's a lot of consolidation going on, right? A lot of companies being reorganized, absorbed into others and all that kind of stuff. You know, obviously, you know, it's it's always interesting to me because the gaming community is always all about diversification and, and all that kind of stuff. But in the end, it seems to be that, Everybody wants an oligopoly, you know, everybody wants to yeah. <laughs> wants wants the big uh, bad to come in and actually tell them what to what to what to like. You know, how do you resolve that tension or is or is there even that tension? So, I mean, I'm of two minds uh, on this. So, the like pragmatically the human in me is like, yeah, competition is always good. This consolidation is bad. It's it's a bad thing for the gamers if there isn't an incentive to produce the best possible product and, and, and take their money. Like, that is true. The metaverse Kool-Aid drinker inside me is has a counterpoint, which is there is there's a positive that comes out of this, which is that if there isn't a pathway to inter- to blockchain interoperability and getting these different disparate platforms to actually agree to stitch together, then then the other pathway to having an actual metaverse is consolidation until one or two platforms control the virtual universe and i'll tell you that that is literally i mean they're not going to admit this on the record but that is probably epic games's long-term game plan just like for ev- for everything they do is to get that billion player scale and then you know no matter how you get there you then you own a whole virtual you own the metaverse you own this whole virtual world and you can you can skim a little tax off of every transaction that takes place inside it and make millions. So if if one company, if, if if the metaverse space consolidates enough to the point where one company controls that billion player user base, the co- the question of interoperability becomes irrelevant because they just control that whole world. And and just as a little addendum to that, all of the fictional description, all the fictional portrayals of the metaverse um, that I think are are most exciting slash prescient are rooted in the idea that one corporation will own it. Uh, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, which is the progenitor of the metaverse, that virtual world is owned by one corporation. Uh, The Oasis in Ready Player One is owned and controlled by one corporation. And I think it's to some extent because these authors realize that that is the only actual way that we're going to get there. Are the machines in the matrix a centralized authority? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Question that I I have to have to ask. I wonder I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're both saying, right? I, I understand uh, one of the many reasons why Jason wants you on the show. Um, you guys agree to a large extent. Uh, there, there's something about that consolidation though, right? I mean, they they get it wrong a lot, right? There've been flops from um, centralized authorities. You know, I'm old enough to remember New Coke and these things, uh-huh. you know, have, have been happening for a really long time. Um, they're, another sort of different angle is sort of the the open source right? A way in which that blockchain often operates, right? I think, I mean, I, Epic and its Unreal Engine, I, I think it's open source in the sense that you can sort of build on it, but they keep its its backend, for lack of a better term, close to the best, right? right. Um, and I think that that is, you know, one way that the, the consolidators, for lack of a better term, are going to try to build a metaverse. But there's always going to be the constraints there. And I feel that there's enough people, as, as, in gaming, like every other industry, who are going to want to push envelopes, right? I guess what I'm asking you is, 
Yes, the future that you're talking about certainly was anticipated in the past in science fiction. And we see consolidation not only in this industry, but every industry, right? Mm. Um, but isn't there always that that drive? Do you think that gaming is somehow different from other creative endeavors where people involved in gaming just don't care so much about about ownership of the rules, that, that they're okay with other people owning the rules? No, I mean, I, I think that 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 drive absolutely exists in gaming like it exists in every other art form but gaming is stymied in that way because the the most powerful tools for game creation are products that are that are manufactured by a company and that, that needs to make a, a a profit from them i mean whether it's unreal engine or unity you know game engines you know you you have to pay a subscription to them you have to license them it's um th those are the you know the chalk and paint of this medium to some extent mm -hmm. and so it's just it's a little harder to open source gaming as a result i mean that's a reductive thing to say because indie games exist and you can totally create your own game engine um and many games do that so uh, you know i think there is there's space for that and and certainly the idea of open source game development is i think an area in which blockchain technology could actually be really beneficial now that i'm just kind of thinking out loud but um it's less accessible you know if if you want if you want to just be like an entry level game developer it's way easier to just like plug into Unreal Engine or something like that than to do it yourself. As opposed to when you're starting out as a painter, painter or a writer, all you need is a pen or uh, you know a, a, a paintbrush or whatever. So it's, yeah, the accessibility issue, I think, is is the real cause. I hear you. Like I'm a, um, we had another episode with Evan Matthews on and he's doing interesting things with comic books. And when I was in my twenties and, you know, well, even before that I was in middle school when image came out, right. Everybody thought there's no way you can have your own publishing house for comics. You've got Marvel, you've got DC, everybody else shut up. Um, but that's not the way it worked, right. There was just, there was that drive. And I guess now I think that the tools to create the paint and the chalk, as you call it, they're almost easier to access, right? Even than it was back then uh, when we had a few artists create a, a new comic book label. Uh, so I hear you both. I do. I guess I have a lot more faith <laughs> in humanity that we're going to not, you know, give in to the consolidators, that there, there is a drive. And like you say, indie games exist. Um, and I hear you. It's hard. It's expensive. But as the tools become cheaper... I, I hope that we see that future, right? I like the idea that sure, you know, we have to pay a subscription, but you know, what if we all owned the wallet where that subscription went? And I think that that's one of the promises of Web3. Yeah, no, I I, I totally hear you. And uh, I, I hope you're right. Can I just say that? Like, I hope you are right. And I'm sorry for coming on here and slinging all of the cynicism. <laughs> um, I'm really excited about the concept of the metaverse and I would love to get there. Uh, so... Yeah, please, please take what I say with, you know, at least a few grains of salt. You know, I, I think I think the, the big thing here is 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 uh, there's a there's a human drive. And I agree with both of you, actually. You know, I mean, I I tend to play the cynic, uh, you know, on, on all of this kind of stuff because, you know, human nature and all that. But, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, there's always a drive to create and everything like that. And, you know. With Web 2, I think maybe we got a little spoiled, right? Because the people that actually did create it really started out from a position of, hey, we're we're a bunch of nerds making something really cool. Well, let's set up a bunch of standards and let's really re reinforce those standards and work through foundations and nonprofits and all that kind of stuff. Whereas with Web 3, we're, you know, we've we, not all, not exclusively, but we've largely gone the other way. So the, but the thing about it is Web2 is not open source and, you know, beautiful all, all over now either, right? There's lots of consolidation in that space. Is it just, are we all moving towards the same thing just from different directions? It's like, is Web3 going to resemble Web2 at a certain point? Because ultimately there is an incentive, as Philip was saying, for to loosen the reins a little bit, right? Because, you know, there's not one publisher in the world, as we know, that can create an, an expansive experience for everybody. It's just impossible. And I think Meta found that, the, that to be the case as well. You do need UGC. You do need other people buying in. You do need somebody, other the community driving the ship to a certain degree. And that's what I think Epic has sort of realized with all the things that they're doing. So it, are we just talking like, is it just semantics or really, or are or, or gamers just going to be, you know, exploited for the lack of a better word? <laughs> well, I don't know if this answers your question, but like, it's paradoxical. I mean, there's a, 
There's a consolidation that's happening, but with that consolidation comes opportunities for fragmentation as well. So, so to some extent, maybe all gamers are getting driven into you know specific platforms like Unreal Engine or Roblox that are owned by this overarching authority. Uh, but as a result of that, that allows them to plug into this UGC world where like anyone can be a game developer and you can create like premium quality gaming experiences without being bankrolled by an Activision Blizzard or something like that. Uh, and so it's similar to what's happening across all other forms of entertainment, right? I mean, 20, 30 years ago, everyone was going home and watching The Office or, you know, whatever other network TV show. And now that yet, yeah, like, yes, we still all kind of go to the, the same few streaming platforms for our content. Uh, but there's been this propagation of content almost as because of the competition between them uh, that I think allows people to dig into a bigger niche uh, and has gotten rid of this sort of like main line of, you know, just uh, what's the word? like mon the monopolization of culture that that happened in the past. And I think the same thing is kind of paradoxically paradoxically happening thanks to the rise of user generated content inside games. Um, but that's empowered by the fact that people are discovering UGC by being forced into centralized platforms to some extent. I don't think it's a bad thing personally. Like I, I, I don't think, I don't see Epic Games or Roblox as malevolent forces at all. I think that they are fairly trying to make money by building virtual worlds. Uh, and right now at the very least, there's actually competition directly between them, which is healthy and makes it so that they don't, take advantage of gamers. Um, if Now, if one of them wins and becomes the dominant metaverse platform in the future, then that competition will be gone and those guardrails will be gone. Um, I'm not, but I, I don't think that the companies are run by evil people. So the jury is out on what effect that will have. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not willing to say it's inherently a bad thing right now. Absolutely, you know, uh... It, again a lot of this kind of like idea about like culture and and user you know being a canadian uh and it's something i always like to mention you know coming to america it's always just amazing to me just to what extent like you know uh there's ownership over like a global culture and a collective sort of de desire to to sort of run it right uh, among you know Americans, you know what I mean? Whereas like in Canada, you just sort of take it for granted that you're not going to be the person driving the ship. You're just going to be the passenger on the American ship. Uh, and, you know, as a like the rumor on a shark, you're just going to go along with it. You know what I mean? Um, you know, <laughs> you know, um, I think you're you're describing a world, Alex, where in, in a certain way, people are going to have the tools, right? There's going to be a giant sort of, uh, you know, either conglomerate or or something that actually builds up uh, uh the tools and the and the basic base world but it's going to be built in by other people right and 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 you know the culture cannot be dictated top down right uh to a certain extent and i think that's pretty positive um the real question that I, the, the sort of like concluding questions from my perspective that i have is, are just you know do at the end of the day do, do gamers actually care about who owns what? I mean, it, it really, at the end of the day, I mean, for us, and of course, Philip and I, we're attorneys, we're going to always think about it, you know, in terms of who owns what and who registers it and all that kind of stuff, right? Because that's just, that's just their discipline. But from a gamer's perspective, you know, I was just at TwitchCon this past weekend. Everybody was happy to hail corporate, right? The, there were more brands there than people, <laughs> it feel, felt like. Like, do gamers actually care if it's cool? Like, do they, who, who, who gives a toss, you know? Yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, like, I, I'm inclined to say not that much now. I mean, it goes to what I was saying about the generational shifts in, in, in how people perceive games and brands involvement in games. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, gamers are focused on what's in front of them. Like, if, if you give them a great product, they are going to be happy regardless of how that product is bankrolled or the ways it's actually trying to take advantage of their attention to make money. Um, and I think that applies to all aspects of gaming fandom. I mean, if you, it applies to esports as well, for example. Uh, we're now seeing that like the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund is purchasing up a lot of different esports products. And that has caused a certain amount of outrage within this kind of rarefied layer of like, 
esports journalists and some executives who are focused on the human rights abuse or who are fairly focused on the human rights abuses and maybe don't want to be associated with that kind of money. But the the overwhelming majority of gamers are not even aware that Saudi Arabia now owns their favorite tournament broadcasts made by ESL or Face It. And in fact, they now just notice that there's a much higher production value being put into these things and they're just happy. And so at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if this this is that different than people consuming any other form of media, but I don't think gamers care about the ownership or about brand involvement or whatever, as long as the product is fundamentally good. So if it's easy to use and, you know, if, if so if, if blockchain and, you know, uh, Web3 tools are, are built in, they're easy to use uh, and they don't require quite as much FAF uh, to, to set up as now, gamers will probably go along with it. Is that what you're saying, Alex? I would totally say that. Yeah. And and we're starting to see that that kind of arise as a reaction to the revulsion or, or not, I would say revulsion, but just like the gamers on unwillingness to adopt web3 technology in a large amount um a term that you guys may or may not have seen thrown around is is this idea of on-chain games where every aspect of the game is coded onto some and, and this is getting to the limits of my blockchain technology understanding but every aspect of the game is directly coded onto some kind of chain so that users do not need a wallet themselves to play the game but it but the game itself is still on the blockchain and and like immutable in in whatever sense that happens to mean for this specific game and i think that is the secret use blockchain technology in a way that prepares us for that potential future of interoperability but don't make today's gamers go through the hoop jump through the various hoops and headaches required to use the technology um and and yeah and, and i would say this is something that we are actively starting to see more and more uh, in web3 game development as a reaction to gamers lack of understanding of the technology which is a good thing I can see that. I mean, if there's a parallel with, for example, TikTok, if you ask an alpha, you know, if they like TikTok, they'll say yes. If you ask, you know, someone, probably me or older, they freak out that it's a Chinese company and it's being, you know, we're getting all our information. You're like, yeah, some people just don't care because the interface is great. You know, TikTok does what TikTok does really well, right? So like that- That's that, a great that, example, yeah. Right, that sort of blase attitude for the the younger makes, makes sense because it's such a good product. And I do hear you, right? We talked about how, Web two versus Web three, but what I what I think I just heard is, in a certain sense, Web three has to become more Web two ish, right? Easy to use, right? There's a reason that I just pick up my phone and click click, and I'm ready to go, um, because it's been centralized. It's really smooth. It's really easy. There's very low friction. Whereas Web three, you know, you pretty much need a computer science degree to really interact right now, and that is, you know, a, a bad scene that needs to get fixed. And I think once it is. Uh, hopefully we'll see sort of a change in not only, you know, gamers attitudes towards Web3, but everybody, right? Everybody's consumption of Web3 products will be made, you know, much easier once it's easier to access Web3 products. I'm always amazed, you know, it just came out like uh, this week you know, to to really, you know, date this pod podcast. But the thing about it is like, uh, you know, that, you know, some manufacturers, uh, car manufacturers are not happy with, you know, the rollout of a EVs and stuff like that, right? Because ultimately, it's a lot harder for people to, you know, build an infrastructure network to support their electric vehicle, especially out east, right? In California, it's a lot better, I understand. But, you know, but the thing is, it's pretty tough to do that kind of stuff. Like, you know, Every other industry seems to have figured out to a certain degree that you need to make things as, as easy as possible for the general public. But yeah, I mean, obviously, we're still going through that sort of uh, development process in, in, in sort of Web3 and blockchain. So final question from me, if, if I was going to give you or if we were going to give you a 10 second soapbox, right? What would you tell publishers and developers about, you know, uh, the metaverse and and using Web3 tools and all that kind of stuff? What What is it that you wish that they kept in mind and uh you can't believe they're not doing oh geez that's a, a 10 seconds uh i feel like I probably take 20 take one. 30 it's all you know it's uh <laughs> you know it's a just it's a guideline more than more than a rule 10 metaseconds just <laughs> <laughs> okay here's what i would say um right now publishers are approaching this concept of the metaverse as the next social media explosion and and that's how they're communicating it to brands um you want to have a presence on roblox or on fortnite because you sure wanted to have a presence on twitter and facebook right that's what they're saying and i think that is that is good for upping the urgency but that misses the real value of these platforms and these environments um the reality is that 
not every brand needs is best served by having its own space. These environments like Roblox have tons of organic UGC spaces that can be a wonderful breeding ground for brands to plug into. Racing games in which existing automobile brands can put their vehicles. Um, I, I know about Nerf blasters being put into various shooting games. Um, that's another great way to you know promote your product. I think that's way better than having a uh, Ford World or Hasbro you know, Hasbro, Hasbro <laughs> rainforest or like whatever. Um, the companies and brands that are well served by having their own virtual environments are the ones that have intellectual property that people actually care about engaging with. Uh, whether that is, you know, just like a television show or movie with characters that people like, or, uh, you know, a Tony, the tiger or some kind of other, um, branded IP or, or mascot. Um, and so, we're starting to see this early wave of what I would describe as misfires, which are things like the Wendy's verse and Walmart world. And that is a direct result of the way that the, the publishers are framing this as a sort of social media opportunity. And that's not really what this is. Uh, this is more like a way to use experiential marketing, like what we would see in real life in a really expansive way that reaches scale and is much cheaper uh, to develop than than IRL experiential marketing, but just like experiential marketing, it's not something that every brand needs to do. So that I don't know if that answers your question, and it was definitely more than ten seconds. But yeah, here we are. That was brilliant. I mean, and now you want me wanting a digital? Well, they do they do flurries, right? Not <laughs> blizzards or anything of the sort. Um, <laughs> oh God, I should know this. Frosty? <laughs> but, is it a frosty? Wait, I don't know. Frosty, yeah, that's yeah. right. The frost. It's been a while since I've been to a, a Wendy's, be it virtual or or not. Um, now I I love that, right? I mean, for Disney, it makes a lot of sense, right? They have a universe of intellectual property that people want to dive into, but you know, not so much my you know cured coffee maker. I don't I don't need you know a, a world for that. And can I should I be able to buy a virtual pod? Yeah, maybe, but I don't need a, an island to visit yeah. for coffee. Put a virtual Keurig in your sims house or something yeah. you know i mean just thinking out loud but yeah there's a there's a totally. place for curing in the virtual world it's just you know you got to be targeted yeah you know, disclaimer I, we're not getting paid by Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> well you know that 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 leads me to the fact that uh you know hey i want a current car uh you know no <laughs> I know. so uh well you know that's all that's all i have philip anything else for uh for alex no, but thank you so much, right? It's a, it's a really interesting perspective. Um, I, I know Jason, of course, sort of is in that same world. He and I sort of have our differences about how the metaverse goes, but I, I love your articulation of it and your the, the granularity you bring to it, that it is a great thing, but it's going to be different for everybody. Um, I just, uh, thank you so much for being here. It was really a pleasure, guys. Uh, and I appreciate the good questions and the fascinating discussion. So hopefully you can make something out of this. Feel free to edit it to your heart's content. So I actually... Sound like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, we're just, we're gonna put banjo music behind you the whole time. It's gonna be perfect. <laughs> that's what I that's what I wanted. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring out a tiny ukulele and uh, apologize <laughs> to listeners. So, uh, I, God, did I just make a Miranda sings thing? All right, anyway, uh, ooh, I think it, I, I think it's time to wrap. Thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks.